started. Um, so we're up to lecture 13. I started thinking about the exam. We're going to we're gonna have an exam due in two weeks from Thursday. So uh, I guess I could try to get it to you this week if you need it. What do you think? Two weeks is a long time. Or I can give it to you next Tuesday, a week from today. Does that sound about right? Is the size of the test going to vary based on the decision? No, actually, the sooner you... Uh, yeah, something like that. Um, so, okay, well... <clears throat> I guess we better finish the chapter first, maybe, though I'm about ready to be finished with it. <laughs> um, let's see, we're still a little bit in the middle of Parseval's relationship. We haven't quite finished it. Uh, you have homework due this week, so are there are questions about it? Parseval's relation? I just had a question on the first one. I just wondered exactly what they were asking for. Okay, let's have a look. 3.5, who we're talking? Yeah. I wasn't sure what we're supposed to show. It was just the grammar structure. Yeah, the first so 3.5, number 6. Show. Are we supposed to show that this is the um, inner product? Yes. Okay. okay. So, so assume that these series product. converge. Assume that these series converge. Okay. okay. So, so 5. Point, <coughs> five point three point five number 6. Assume x equals summation... Um, Alpha G, so E E K is orthonormal sequence in Hilbert space H. Given right, given an orthonormal sequence in Hilbert space H. Assume summation alpha J E J J goes from one to infinity, converges in H. Assume that y equals summation j goes from 1 to infinity, beta j, ej, converges in h. Show that um, x and y are now elements of h. Show that indeed x, y, which of course makes sense by assumption, okay, is given in terms of the alphas and betas by the formula summation alpha j beta j bar j goes from 1 to infinity and moreover let's show 1 and then 2 that the series this latter series is not only convergent but, but absolutely convergent means if I put absolute value signs, it's also convergent. So, parentheses summation alpha j beta j bar is less than finite. Okay? <coughs> less than infinity, sorry. Um, okay. So, so um, in general, are we going to probably use Parseval's relation? Um, well, you have this theorem, I think it's 352 or something like that. That's, this is from section 35. Yeah, this didn't count. We haven't had it yet. We haven't got there yet. No. Okay. This is from 352. I believe the theorem 352 is let H be a Hilbert space. We did go through that last time. Suppose you have an orthonormal sequence there, then the series alpha k e k converges in H if and only if the sum of the squares of the alphas converges. Okay, so use theorem three five two. A, <laughs> we'll pretty much do it uh, to start off, and then the rest is kind of other stuff. I think it's three five A that you're going to need. Okay. Um, okay, that's about that question. Um, what else? Anybody look at anything else in this one? On the next question, 5.8. Okay. 
let's see. So for the direction where we assume that x can be represented as the summation of the Fourier coefficients. Three five the uh three five point eight, let's see that. So um so it's an infinite Okay, so we're saying in the forward let let uh so you want to show x can be represented? So let x actually starting with x can be represented. Show okay, assume x equals summation alpha k e k, k goes from one to infinity with alpha k equals x e k. All right. Show um, x is in is in uh, m bar for m equals the span of e1, e2, and so on. So again, uh, e k is an orthonormal sequence, O N S, in Hilbert space H. This is for three five number six. Use three five two. Are we going to use it again? What's the big theorem in the chapter? Okay, let's see. And how do you prove it? There's not a very much theory in this chapter because it's all about Fourier coefficients. So, theorem. Okay. So you show that it's in M bar. How would you do that? Well, show. Well, okay. Well, here. I mean, this is this is this direction is fairly fairly easy because um, x is a limit of elements from M. Okay, because this is the limit. N goes to infinity. Summation k goes from 1 to n. Alpha k, e k. All right, so that equals the limit of xn where xn is in the span, okay? So, so any limit point is either in M proper or at worst in M bar. Okay, so that's the only if, all right? Now, what's the if? If it is in M bar, we want to go the other way. So this was the, this direction. For the, for, for the forward direction, you need to assume that x is in the uh, M bar. Okay, and then you want to show that it can be written that way. Okay, um, so um, <coughs> so how would you do that? Yes. You know, I tried to crunch out the inner product. So convert the norm squared into the inner product. And then just work it all out. I ended up with something that looked like it worked. Okay. Um.
what I suggest is write this. After you, you got you got the xn and all that going, I suggest writing out Bessel's inequality for x minus xn. So you have x minus xn squared. Okay. You already know what the alpha. Okay. Um, is greater than or equal to summation k goes from 1 to infinity x minus x n e k squared okay and from there you should be able to show that the alpha k is equal to x e k all right you have, might have to take a couple cases basically um, Either where where x n where x n uh, yeah and then the actual formula for x n is it stops somewhere to k sub n let's say alpha k e k it has to be some finite sum right of alpha k so I represent x n this way. And there's a couple of cases, either this kn keeps going off to infinity. You can make the kn bigger if you want. Or it doesn't, all right? If it doesn't, it's kind of trivial, okay? But if it does, then you can, you can work it out like this. So see if you can finish it from there. That's one suggestion. There might be other ways to do it. So I'll just write out Bessel's inequality. This has to go to zero because you're assuming that x is in m bar. This goes to zero, as n goes to infinity by assumption. Okay, so that should get it to, to go. Because you got something going to zero bigger than something else, so that means it's, that has to go to zero too. Okay, and you can write it out explicitly. Pretty much explicitly, okay? Yeah. That was a bit of a harder problem. Okay. Bessel's inequality is the main tool uh, for all of this business. Okay. So, um, then we had the definition of total. Are there any more questions? We didn't, maybe we didn't get into those problems yet, 3.6. Because we didn't do that much about totalities. Um, Okay, so I have one little tiny bit left of these notes. Then I go on to the ones that I just handed you. Let's see if I got some out here for you. 6A. Did you get them? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. There you go. Uh, okay. So we decided that to define a total orthonormal sequence as one where the closure of M here. So the, in this problem, the, the sequence is not assumed to be total. So you're working with M bar, all right? So actually, what we'll get is a corollary of this problem when we talk about the total case. Uh, that work. Oh boy, look at that. Okay, so we say definition uh, a, a set, orthonormal set, E kappa. He sometimes just calls it M, but then he also uses M to talk about the span of an orthonormal set. Orthonormal. I really shouldn't use ONS because that could mean orthonormal set. Okay. <laughs> In, uh, in a product space X, all right? 
uh, means is total. Okay, is total means that with capital M equals the span of this set of vectors, E kappa, kappa in the index set I, then the closure of M bar is all of X. Okay, that's what it means to have a total orthonormal set in an inner product space. That was the definition. Well, that is the definition. And generally, we'll be working with a Hilbert space. So what you have is a corollary of 3.58, actually, if you're working with the Hilbert space. And you have a total orthonormal se uh, sequence. OK. Then what you have is that um, x in h, if and only if it can be written this way, x can be re rewritten in terms of the total orthonormal basis. Okay, so actually, problem eight gives you what you want. <laughs> okay, and it actually comes as a is a cor is a corollary of the proof of theorem three point six dash two, I believe. Um, Actually, now 3 dash, 3.6 dash 4. Okay, this representation of x comes out as 3.6 dash 4. So you can also look to the proof of that theorem if you like. Sometimes he's a little bit one section ahead with these problems. I noticed that uh, with that Fourier, Fourier problem where he talked about the number of Fourier coefficients that are of size bigger than 1 over m. There was a nice little reference to uh, a, a page in the next section that talked, you know, that described what he was talking about. So it's always good to read one section ahead, at least one section ahead. And then if you didn't look that up, <laughs> page 165, okay, had the little business on uh, what he's talking about Fourier coefficients. That's one of the author's favorite tricks. Give you a problem and then one section ahead tell you what the answer is. Okay. <laughs> so read ahead just a little bit, maybe. Uh, one section is my suggestion. It might help on some of these problems. Um, okay. So he's given, you know, there's just, there's just not enough problems otherwise. He's got to take little problems apart and do this little piece, this little piece. So there's really only one main idea, and that's in the theorem. Okay. There's somewhere in the next section, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> Or, but it might already be nascent, you know, in, in the current section. You see what I mean? It's a matter of how well developed it is, how much you know. Okay. So that's the definition. So the span of this, you should get everything in the closure. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. So what's the main theorem here? The theorem here is that three point first was three six two, then we'll get to three six four. Three point six dash two is if this E kappa is orthonormal is a total orthonormal set. Um, in X, in, we're only talking, when I say X here, it means an inner product space, otherwise we can't talk about it. Then, it's going to give you the more general thing. Then, then first, I'll call this equation one, X is perpendicular to e, K, e kappa for every kappa in I implies that X must be the zero vector. Okay, if you're perpendicular to everything, then you must be the zero vector. Conversely, if one holds, but now and x is complete, and x is Hilbert space, okay, then 
the set E kappa is total. Okay. If I get any more, any better re. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay, so that's the thing we want to prove. And it's actually, it's based on, he's already got this little lemma. 3.5-3, um, right at the end of the session there involving a statement about orthogonal complements and whatnot. But I'm going to pretty much, instead of rewriting that whole lemma, I'm just going to give the guts of the proof. No, that's not, I'm sorry, that's the wrong lemma. It's 3-4. Uh, <coughs> No, no. I think it's back in three three. Ah, where is it? Yeah, three three seven. Is that what he's talking about? Yeah, basically three three seven is something about a uh, lemma about dense sets. Okay, because here the span. What another way of saying this is that the span is dense. M is dense. In X is the definition. M bar equals X. Right, this is the definition of a dense set. The closure should be the whole space. Okay. Okay. That's the definition of what a dense set is. Everybody clear? That's the the one liner. All right. Just put the bar over the top and make equal to the whole space. That means dense. Uh, so he's got a little lemma three three seven about dense sets. <coughs> And I'm just going to include basically the guts of that lemma here in the proof. It's not very difficult. Uh, so you can refer back to that lemma if you like for your reading for sure. And I think I did cover it in the notes as well, though it's probably not a whole lot different. Maybe a little bit clearer from what he wrote there. Let's see. So first, if I do have this M is dense, then I claim that M must be, that X must be perpendicular. But if the X is perpendicular to everything in that, well, all the generators of that dense set, then X must be zero. Okay, let's see. That should be quite easy, shouldn't it? Let's see. Let's see, let's go, for, I, let's go forward first, since, even though I wrote it the other way in my notes. Let X uh, be an M perp. Uh, I mean, the, ortho, the orthogonal complement of M, which is what I've got here. All right? X is perpendicular to everything. Okay? Now, it is given that M is dense. So m bar is equal to x. So um, therefore, x is in m. The closure of m is well. Okay. So I've got x in the uh, orthogonal complement of m, and I also have x in the closure of m. I claim those two things together make x equal to zero. Well, let's see. Um, so. There exists an xn going to x, all right, xn in m, with xn converging to x, and the inner product of xn with x is equal to zero for every n, because xn is in m, but x is in the orthogonal complement. So, letting n go to infinity, obtain that the, earth, that the inner product of x with itself is equal to zero. So x is equal to zero. Okay? Uh, the norm, so x is equal to zero. The norm, the square of the norm is equal to zero, which implies x is equal to zero. Okay. So you get this stuck like that. What about the converse? Now, 
So conversely, if one holds, so I did get one, one holds. X perpendicular to every generator implies X equal to zero. Now go the other direction. Suppose this is true, and show that you have that the, it was pretty much what you had to do, right? <laughs> okay, let's see how we could do it this way. Um, of course, we're working with the orthogonality here. All right, so let's have this one. Um, okay, if one holds, then the orthogonal complement of, of M is equal to the zero vector. All right, that's what it's saying. Anything that's orthogonal to everything in M is zero. It can only be the zero vector, okay? Okay, but um, the closure of M contains M. Now, what happens when you have containment is the orthogonal complement goes the other way because everything that's orthogonal to a bigger set is smaller. Right? There's more conditions. I have to be orthogonal to not only everything in M, but also everything in M bar. Okay, there's more conditions. Therefore, the orthogonal complement is smaller. It's a subspace. So, I think there's a, there's a homework problem that makes you go through that basically say, well, B contains A in the orthogonal complement of B is inside the orthogonal complement of A. There's some interesting orthogonal complement problems that I probably won't put on the test because the answer is in the back of the book. But, uh, <laughs> okay, because otherwise they're impossible to do. But, <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, this, is, this comes obvious, okay? But the orthogonal complement of M is already zero, so that means the orthogonal complement of M bar is the zero. Okay, but M, but the closure of M is a closed subspace. And I'm assuming now complete. I'm assuming I have a Hilbert space. But the closure of M is closed in Hilbert space now, okay? I should call it is complete. So x equals h is the assumption in the second half of the theorem. It's not actually an if and only if it's two pieces of one theorem, okay? So in the first half, in the first implication, I only assumed I had an inner product space, but in the second implication, I'm assuming that the inner product space is, in fact, the Hilbert space. Now, I have a closed subspace of Hilbert space. So by the projection theorem, since the orthogonal complement of this closed subspace is a zero, that means the m bar is the whole Hilbert space. So therefore, by 3.3-4, that was the projection theorem, m bar equals h. Okay? And that's what I want. Okay. So the projection theorem comes to save us, and you could say, well, what is that? Let's go through that again. <laughs> okay. Um, if you really want to look at it again, but I think that'll be the theorem. Okay. So what else is, okay, 364 then. Let's get to that. Uh, this 363 totality and then 364. Oh, 36, I'm sorry, 363 is the main theorem in this section. 364 has to do with separable Hilbert spaces. That's, I'm not going to cover that today. 363 is the total, theorem on totality. So I think I made an incorrect reference before to problem three, 358. Uh, correction. 3.5 number 8 related to theorem 3.6 dash um, 3. Okay. Sorry about that. I think I said 3.6 dash 4. All right. All the theorem numbers. Okay. So let's have that one. 
I think that's on notes A here, 6A, that I've published and sent out to you. I call it 6A because I had a little bit more to say about 3.6, and also I put in the Weierstrass approximation <laughs> theorem in there, uh, a proof of it that we can, that is that you could uh, introduce to Math 532 or other courses. It's not that difficult. You need to know a little bit about uniform convergence. That's all for the definition of the theorem. So we'll cover that again. I think we'll we'll. When we actually come to the Weierstrass approximation theorem, you'll have a proof in the book, and you'll also have this proof, as well as many other proofs. There are many, many proofs of the Weierstrass approximation theorem. Um, the reason I put that in there is because he mentioned, the author mentions that that's how you show that, for example, the um, the Legendre polynomials are total in L2. Of zero one, so is how you're going to show that the tree polynomials, the tree system is is total in uh, L two as well. Okay. That's one of the ways, anyway. So I'll try to explain that uh, when we get to it. So we're going to kind of put off this discussion of totality a little bit, just until, we, until the time comes to discuss this for our approximation theorem. Is that fair? All right. So let's have the Parseval relationship. And after you get all this together, you'll say, okay, I understand Hilbert spaces. <laughs> okay. it's, I think you already have, most people already have the picture. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you start with a, a, a vectored Hilbert space and you have an orthonormal sequence, then, uh, or even just an inner product space, you can construct you can construct a Fourier series and it may or may not converge to X, and it all depends on whether You've got a complete space and a total system, okay? Okay. So, so here it is. Let E1, E2 be an orthonormal sequence. Now, I'm only going to probably do the proof here for sequences. Uh, the rest of the proof is in, in notes also in the book for orthonormal sets. Orthonormal sets. It just turns out that the, the if you have an orthonormal set, the number, there can only be accountably many Fourier coefficients that are non-zero. Where that argument go? Let me just write down the theorem first, then I'll do the aside, okay? Then, in a, in a Hilbert space, H, then A, this sequence is total <coughs> if and only if for every x in H, there holds the Parseval relation. The norm of x squared is equal to the sum of the Fourier coefficients squared, uh, absolute value squared. That's Parseval relation. Okay, and moreover, if E kappa kappa in I is an uncountable orthonormal set,
Then the set is total. We still have the Hilbert space H. We already had that assumption here, that I had Hilbert space. Uh, I better put that in, in H. Okay. Then the set is total if and only if star continues to hold. I think I wrote continuous to hold, but continues to hold where the sum uh, is now overall kappa with the Fourier coefficient of x corresponding to kappa is unequal to zero. And I say C lemma three five dash three where you have more about this. <laughs> okay. What's going on is that that there'll only be countably many kappa where the Fourier coefficient can be non-zero. The kappas that, that would count would depend on x. But that's all right. So given x, there will be, you replace the k by kappa, there'll be uh, just countably many kappas where you have non-zero numbers in here. Okay. Moreover, um, um, 353 gives you a little bit more information that you can actually, if you actually look at the, the Fourier series corresponding to those kappas. This is the, not the Fourier series, this is the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients. But if you look at the Fourier series, x e kappa times e kappa, right, then that could be rearranged. So, uh, of course, that'll follow by Bessels. <coughs> because indeed, uh, well, anyway, it will. I believe. Okay. So, then B, I guess I call this statement B. I'm only going to prove A here today. I think it's just B is not a really harder. Uh, but why? But maybe now is the time for the aside. Why are there only countably many non-zero Fourier coefficients? Then we need to go through that argument just slightly. It can be you can have Hilbert spaces with an uncountable orthonormal set. We're not going to encounter any today, but if you did, <laughs> why would you know there's only finally many non-zero Fourier coefficients? Because you look at uh, okay, the number of kappa such that x e kappa is unequal to zero. No, aside. Okay, then we get so, okay. It is only countable. Or the set of kappa. Not the number, well, unless you want to talk about cardinality, the number, the set of kappa, given x, given a particular x, given x and h, the set of kappa such that x e kappa is only countable. Uh, check this. What you have is that the, the the classical way to do it is you look at the the the, uh, the set of x set of x such that uh, x e kappa, so excuse me, the set of kappa in i, such that x e kappa is unequal to zero, okay, is equal to the union over all m equals one to infinity, the set of all kappa in i such that x e kappa is bigger than one over m. Okay, in absolute value. This, uh, 
if you're going to have a non-zero number for the Fourier coefficient, it has to be bigger than some small <coughs> number. Okay? So every one will be counted eventually like that. Now, all you have to argue to show that this set of cap is countable is to show that each of these sets is countable. But in fact, each of these sets is finite, as you showed in your homework problem. But each of these latter sets is, in fact, finite. Our, each of these is, is finite, as shown in homework. I forgot which problem it was. 3.4 point, uh, let's see. Must have been eight. <laughs> Problem 3.4.8. The basic thing was Bessel's inequality. Again, you, ju you just said that uh, you said that uh, you know that the norm of x squared. Indeed, the norm of x squared. We'll just go through this in case anybody still had any questions about it. Was equal to the sum of the squares of, was greater than or equal to the sum of all the squares of the Fourier coefficients, whatever, that were, well, non zero. And I guess this, uh, follows from the previous lemma. Okay, you didn't have to do this in the uncountable case. You didn't have to do this in the, uh, um, Star, yeah. So, um, well, let's do it this way. You could always write, you do it this way. Um, We know, let me put it this way. Put, put, uh, I guess you'd have to choose them. Uh, okay. Well, okay. You have to argue this. Again, it still gets you into a little bit of set theory. Um, X e cap. Uh, um, let's put it bigger than one over m. Uh, X e cap uh, square. You still have to argue this part, okay? Um, I think what you do is you make a finite sum, you cut it off, and then you take the soup over all possible finite sums. Okay, and so this is an upper bound, and you just you get something like this. And so uh, maybe I better not go there. I knew there was going to be something fishy in here. You have to deal with these uncountable sets and how to deal with it. So I think the author probably throws a little bit of that under the rug too. <laughs> I can look it up for you a little bit more. I can finish this argument a little bit, but so here you need to get this, okay? So we're taking all cap in the index set such that the uh, Fourier coefficient is bigger than 1 over m, okay? Once you can get some kind of inequality like this, of course, then each of these is at least 1 over m squared, so there can only be finitely many, okay? This is greater than or equal to the to the number, okay, n sub m times 1 over m squared. Okay, the number where n sub m was the number of them. Okay, there's only so many kappas you can have, <laughs> okay. All right. So I guess um, 
what you can do is you can start counting them. You have to use some way of starting to enumerate the kappas that do it. I think this will do it. So you, you just start um, you just start saying, well, do I have a first kappa? You know, is there another? Is there another one? Okay, is there another one? Is there another one? You form the sum x e kappa uh, e kappa, where these things are greater than 1 over m in absolute value, and you'll find after a while, well, I can't have too many of them because the ek are mutually orthonormal, okay? So then after you get a certain number of them, which is measured by n sub m, at most m squared times x squared, you have to be done. So you only have to count finally many of them. So the only question is whether in this mathematical world you can actually stay, say, well, there's somehow a first cap, a second cap, or a third cap that I would come to, all right, that had non-zero. Is there another one? Is there another one? Which I think most of us will believe. Okay. <laughs> we can say, well, there's a, is there a fish in the pond? Okay, pick one. Is there another fish in the pond? Okay, get it, too. Okay? I can pick one. So that's the uh, question of whether you can choose these things out by our, you know, axioms. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, would the axiom of choice help out there? I would seem so. I would think that would be the thing you would need, which I think, wonder if he sort of shoved that under the rug here. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Because usually we don't invoke the axiom of choice unless we absolutely have to. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was asking here. Okay. Yeah. That, I, that it probably is lurking in there, that's my guess. Yes, sir. Oh, I was just going to say, isn't that disputed, like somewhat, some people don't necessarily want to well, yeah. the Well, yeah, and for the same reason, you're not going to be able to have Zorn's Lemma in the next chapter if we don't accept that. Yeah. Okay. So, we're going to have to go there anyway, because we're going to use Zorn's Lemma. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking about. Maybe we might as well, because we, well, we can't get away from it. Okay, we're going to see in section 4.1, People say, well, ah, do you want to take this course? I don't know. It's going to have Zorn's Lemma in it. No! <laughs> Zorn's Lemma. Okay. Zorn's Lemma. Which we regard as an axiom. Footnote, the name Lemma is for historical revision. Zorn's Lemma can be derived from the axiom of choice. which says blah, blah, blah. Okay. Page 211. Mm -hmm. Okay? I guess it's equivalent to the action of choice, too, I believe. Um, well, the well ordering principle is this is partially ordered, so I guess it's like Maybe it's a little bit well different. Controversy this axiom follows from Zorn's lemma, so that Zorn's lemma and the action of choice can be regarded as equivalent axioms. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, I guess we have to do a little bit more mathematical research to decide whether I'm needing the axiom of choice here. Yeah, I don't know. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's continue. This was the aside. End of aside. Okay. So I'm going to focus on A here. All right. Keep everything countable, which is a lot more comfortable for most people here, including myself. Okay, so how do you prove this statement here? First, I need to go one direction, total, implies Parseval. So let's try that. Maybe just go forward direction first. I don't think there's anything fancy here. Assume that your sequence is total. Uh, yeah, E1, E2, and so on is total. Okay. You're in the Hilbert space by Bessel's inequality. you have the basic starting point that you can um, have a finite series of squares of Fourier coefficients 
Therefore, I can since I have a finite uh, square summable. Excuse me, I have a square summable sequence of complex numbers. I can apply the uh, theorem 362, the previous theorem, that tells me that we proved last time, I believe. No, no, I'm sorry, 352. Therefore, by 352, I'm getting all my numbers mixed up. That's the one that says if I've got um, the square summable sequence, then I can form a su uh, convergent <laughs> sum in Hilbert space. Uh, y equals the sum x e k e k is convergent. Okay, that sum is convergent. Now the question is, is it equal to x? All right, but now we're going to find out. Now x minus y, inner product with e j, is equal to the limit n goes to infinity again by the continuity of the inner product. Good thing. Okay. Uh, x minus summation k goes from one to n. X e. The, take the finite series of this y x e. K E K, inner product with E J, which is simply going to be X E J minus X E J, as soon as N gets large enough, that's what this evaluation is, and take the limit of that equals zero. All right, this <clears throat> so x minus y is perpendicular to m. Okay, we're down here in the lower left right hand corner. X minus y is perpendicular to m, but I had a total Okay, so therefore, by my previous theorem, um, x minus y is equal to zero. My previous theorem says that if I've got that perpendicular n, then then I have to have the zero vector. Okay. So I guess I, therefore x equals y. X minus y equal to zero, or x equals to y. Y. 3, 6, 2. The pre theorem we just proved. Okay? So indeed, if I have a total um, system, then uh, this Fourier series converges to X. Okay? And now just apply the lemma one more time. Okay? I mean, uh, the continuity of the norm one more time, and I'll get equality. Right? So, therefore, I think this is one way to do it. Therefore, uh, x squared equals limit xn xn. I could use the continuity like that. n goes to infinity equals limit k goes from 1 to n as n goes to infinity x e k squared equals the infinite sum. k goes from 1 to infinity x e k square. I think that's how I did it. Did I do it that way? Yes. Okay. I didn't work out the details here. This was summation x e k, x e k bar, I guess. If you do the computation, you got to bring that in. k goes from 1 to n, okay, which is the sum of the absolute value squared of the uh, Fourier coefficients. Okay, so there's a little computation that you have to do xn into xn, which I know you can all do in your sleep. So, that's the first half of the theorem. Now I need to go the other way. I need to show if I have this partial parallel relationship, then I get the totality. Okay. So, how does that go? If M is not total, it's by contradiction, okay? Well, I looked. <laughs> okay, you get stuck here. If M is not total, then there exists a non-zero X which is perpendicular to everything in M.
if m equals the span, what do we call the span of these, equals the span of E1, E2, okay, is not total. Did I call M something? I didn't call M. I think maybe you were confused. What, I, what was I calling M? M was the span here. So when I said X minus, in the previous proof, when I said X minus Y was perpendicular to M, I meant the span of E1 through EK. Uh, excuse me, all of them. The span of the uh, full orthonormal sequence, which I assumed was total. I'm sorry if I missed that notation. Sometimes he's talking about M as the orthonormal set, and sometimes he's talking about M as the span of the orthonormal sequence. Okay. Um, I'm just going to pretty much call M the span in this discussion. <coughs> but you have to be a little bit careful what your notation is. So if M equals not total, let's go the other direction now. I want to prove that I get a contradiction. I'm assuming star here. Let's see if I can get it in before I have to erase star. Okay. Then by 362, there exists an x unequal to 0. Uh, with x and h. Okay. That's perpendicular such that um, x is perpendicular to m. Let's just check that. What was 362 saying? It says uh, one direction was um, right. If uh, is total, then then, okay, let's see. So it says, if you had a complete inner product space, let's see, which part is it? And, uh, The only and the okay and uh, the only vector which is perpendicular to everything in M was the zero vector. Then you had total. Therefore, if not total and you're in the complete situation, the Hilbert space situation, then there has to be somebody that's not perpendicular to M. So I'm using the completeness of the Hilbert space here. I am using the completeness. It's part. It's part. Uh, the second part of theorem 362 that I'm using, the, con the contra positive statement of it. Okay? So it said X is perpendicular to M. Use 362 part 2, or second statement. See, how is it actually written out there? 362. Um, I am using the helper space. Yeah, I'm B. I'm using 362B. There exists x on equal to 0 with x in h such that x is perpendicular to m. Okay, why is that going to give us a problem? So you've got x, e, k. So you have, uh, so therefore, x, e, k is equal to 0 for every k. All right? But you're assuming this star holds now in this part of the proof. Uh, therefore, by star, the norm of x squared is equal to summation x e k squared is equal to zero. That's a contradiction because I just said x was not zero, but now I have the norm equal to zero. Contradiction. Okay, which is the end of the proof then. Okay. I think I'm going to just skip this discussion of separability for the moment. Um, or maybe not. 
you have anything on separability? This is pretty much what I wanted to show for through your homework that's due this week. I might mention something else about separability, I guess. Um, I mentioned already that the countable union of, of countable sets is countable. That you may have in some uh, discrete math course or something. Okay, that doesn't use the axiom of choice. Um, Um, so that brings us into countable dense sets. There's a little bit about separability here. I thought maybe we could uh, backfill a little bit. I think I'll probably put something about separable separability on uh, the test. Yeah. No, I'll just give you a take home. And I think I was mentioning I'll probably give it to you a week from today. I give it to you a week from today. We'll you're going to still have homework next week. Right, you still have homework next week, you have homework this week, you have homework next week, and you have a week to do it. The week of the test, you will not have homework. It's going to be due March 16th then, which is just before we go on break. Yeah. So maybe I should mention a couple of things about separability. Um, one, uh, uh, the classical, ex the easiest example of a non, what is separability? This is, this, this, that was discussed in chapter one a bit, and it's going to become an issue now a little bit. Um, separable means you have a countable dense set. Can you imagine? Can do you know a situation like that? The I mean, word dense again was the closure is equal to the whole space. Can you uh, in the real line? Do you have a countable dense set? Anybody know the answer to that? So we can talk about any metric space being separable. Does anybody know a countable set in the real line that's pretty famous? Uh, no, that's uncountable, actually. <laughs> Joyce would know that. Yeah, no. Uncountable measure zero, right. Um, how about just the good old, um, well, the counting numbers are certainly uh, not dense. They're countable, at least. Okay, what else next after the counting numbers do you usually introduce? Rationals. rationals. Oh, they are yeah. dense. Yeah. They are countable, sure. Okay, the rationals are countable and they're dense. Okay. Irrationals are also dense, but they're not countable. Okay. So, yeah, the rationals. That's, and that's pretty much going to be our model for everything. Okay, so dense set. I'm fevered. Okay, dense set uh, M in a metric space X would be that M bar equals X. Okay. Okay, X is a metric space. So. Uh, X is separable if it has a countable dense set. Okay, so example uh, Q in the reals is countable and dense. You have a little theorem in real analysis. What does it mean, dense? Okay, proof of denseness. Just make sure we can do it. Let um, x in R, okay? I just show that either x is in Q or is a limit point of Q. Show x is in q union the limit points q prime let's just call q, anything prime the the limit points of it okay that would be one way to do it okay oh there's an or another way to do it is um okay so um, 
So I'm, not, I'm trying to show that Q, U, the closure of Q is all of R. I'm not trying to show that Q is closed or anything like that. So it's a little bit different. So I have to show this. I have to show that, that any point can be rep is either in Q or is a limit point of Q. And we're going to see that that's equivalent to every, to another condition. I mean, there's a bunch of equivalent conditions for density, okay? And so let, um, um, okay, let, let little n be in the natural numbers, okay? Then the interval x minus 1 over n to x plus 1 over n contains a rational number. Any open interval, no matter how small, contains a rational number. That's by, you know, the, the, the completeness of the real number system, turns out. Um, is that the way it worked out? I think it's pretty much given by that. You, figure, you work it out. Okay. Um, So this contains a rational number, and therefore, uh, let's call it R sub n. Okay. Therefore, R sub n converges to x. Okay. Therefore, uh, x is in either a rational number itself, but it certainly is at worst a limit point. Okay? Okay. Our equivalent statement of density uh, M in X is dense if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero there exists um, y in m. Excuse me. For every x in uh, for every x in, in, in x for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a y in m, depending on x and epsilon. Okay. <coughs> With the distance between x and y less than epsilon. So no matter where I am in the space, that's the x. However, I start in the space x, there is a y in my subset as close as I like to that x. OK. Um, all right, so we have an example where I do have a, count, uh, uh, a countable dense set. And what about some other examples? What about L2? Is it, is it separable, little L2? And what about little L infinity? Those are the two examples that you basically need to know. Little L2 is, little L infinity isn't. Okay, let me put the little L infinity. You're going to get the little L2 one, essentially, in your test. So, <laughs> yeah. Just a quick question. Where did we use the countability over there? I didn't use it at all. So I'm just saying it's dense. It's countable and dense. It is countable and dense. A proof that it's dense. Proof that it is dense. Well, when, when it says x is separable, if it has a countable dense set? Um, uh, yes. Yes, I have to so verify both properties. Right. I, have to, I have to verify both properties. Yeah. It, Q is countable. We already knew that. Right. Okay. And it's dense. Uh, I had proof that it is dense. Okay? Proof of density. Right. Okay. All right, so I have to verify two properties, countable and dense, to have a separability. So that would normally be something that's too easy to do, then, like for arbitrary no. spaces? Well, yeah, so let's just have, real quick, what's L infinity? Not separable. Why, okay, how do you show that the rational, both, how do you show the rationals are dense, by the way? I mean, the rationals are countable. We just show how they were dense. How do you show the... Somehow you can count them, count the rational numbers. Has everybody seen that before? Yeah. One, two, three, uh, one halves, two halves, three halves, uh, 
blah, 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 uh, one-third, two-thirds, three-thirds, blah, 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 like that, right, the integers, and then divide, like that, and then you start counting like this, like this, so you can count through all of them, like that. Now, how, what kind of similar construction shows that all sequences of ones and zeros is an uncountable set? If I take all sequences of ones and zeros, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, all of these are going to be mutually a distance at least one. All distinct sequences of ones and zeros are now infinity. Because if you take the difference of any two, you're still going to have a one sticking out. Always, right? So all sequences of zeros and ones, that's a big, that's a big set, it turns out, because no matter how you do this, suppose you've got them all listed down, all right? All sequences of ones and zeros um, gives a set M such that for every x and x prime in M, the L infinity distance, L infinity distance between x and x prime is equal to 1. Uh, x for x unequal to x prime. Okay? So, I mean, yeah. There's always going to be a 1 or a minus 1 when you subtract. So, if you take the soup and you're going to get 1 for the distance. Alright, so therefore, if you take the ball of radius 1 half about each of these points, those are mutually um, disjoint. If you take the, the open ball, a radius one half, they're mutually disjoint. You got a mutually, so you got uncountably many mutually disjoint balls, so it's not going to be separable as long as I can show that in fact this is an uncountable set. Okay, because any any countable <coughs> dense set would have to have one point in each of those balls, which would therefore discount the countability. <laughs> okay. You have to have a point from, the, if there were to be a countable density, you'd have to have one in each of these balls, okay? So how do you do it? Well, you basically say, okay, if that's, you construct one that's not in this list. If you assume that you've got a full listing, countable listing, so I've counted them all, okay? I, I count them down by rows. Okay, if I assume they got them all and you come up with a contradiction, you come up with one you didn't count yet. Basically, on the diagonal, you say, if that's a zero, I'm going to make it a one. And if that's a 1, I'm going to make it a 0. I'm going to make it a new sequence that wasn't in the list. It's impossible. Because it's not equal to the first element, it's not equal to the second element, it's not equal to the third element, it's not equal to any of them. So you just change the diagonal. You just flip it. Flip the diagonal element so you create another. If you assume you've got them all listed, then you create another one. Contradiction. That's the basic instruction. So you show that, that's how you show that a binary uh, the numbers in binary form are not countable. Okay, we're over time now. So, so that's an uncountable. Uh, this is can't count all sequences of zeros and ones because if you could, could count them, could count them, then create a new sequence that's not in the list. By flipping um, digits along the diagonal. Okay, and then just take that, take that sequence, which is the diagonal sequence. It can't be equal to any of the other ones, any of the previous ones. It can't be equal to the first one because I got the first digit wrong. It can't be equal to the second one because I got the second digit wrong. It can't be equal to the third one because I got the third digit wrong. Okay. So, okay. So that's all I'll do about countability and uncountability. That's the basic. Those are the basic tricks.
and union of countable sets is countable. Go to your discrete math class, <laughs> I guess, with that. Maybe you should, yes. Countable union of countable sets is countable. That's the other main theorem. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you.